Please welcome the keynote speaker, Dr. Miles Oglethorpe, Chair of the International Committee for the Conservation of Industrial Heritage, better known as TIKI. Dr. Miles is the Head of Industrial Heritage at the Historic Environment Scotland. The title of his speech today is, Now is the time for our industrial heritage to prove its value. Hello. Greetings to the Asian Network of Industrial Heritage. My name is Miles Oglethorpe and I'm president of Tiki at the moment. I wanted to start by saying thank you for your invitation to speak at the forum today. Um, I am in fact very sad that I can't be with you in person today because I've been to a couple of forums before and they have been truly outstanding occasions and I've loved every moment of them and I was looking forward to this one before obviously the pandemic intervened. So I'm very sorry not to be with you but at the same time I'm very delighted to be able to join you in this virtual form. And it is true that the pandemic has brought about true tragedy on a global scale and no country and very few people have been left untouched by it but it has undoubtedly brought unexpected benefits and one of those is the virtual and digital revolution that we've all been turbocharged into some of us less voluntarily than others i confess to being very nervous of the technology but in truth it has been empowering so today I, I, I'm in effect going to be trying to talk to you about turning adversity into advantage, which this technology helps us do. Um, and I think in the process of doing this, um, we need to be sure that we ensure industrial heritage is recognized for the asset that it is. Um, and that in the context of the pandemic recovery, it has a great deal to offer. So, a few things I'd like us to think about, and like you to think about, uh, while this presentation proceeds. We need to, as I said, to remind ourselves of the value of industrial heritage. Uh, we think we must emphasize its strategic value in a wider context beyond heritage. And we need to identify the values that make it an asset and not a liability. We have to bear in mind that many people do not see it this way many people see industrial heritage as an obstacle and we need to change their minds we need to remember um, that it is in effect a major link to the people's history to real history and that means it has value to communities and if you look at the recently updated unesco world heritage guidance the word community has been in, introduced in so many parts of it and they see uh, working with heritage as being a bottom-up process that begins with the communities and getting communities on board now industrial heritage is so well placed to do that it's particularly powerful in the context of place making and sustainable development and it's a vital resource in achieving recovery and regeneration where there have been issues of decline and loss of community morale it's an intergenerational asset and an educational asset, so it allows us to speak between our generations. And I don't think any other branch of heritage offers this sort of potential. So the Asian Network of Industrial Heritage and its global partners, uh, European Roots of Industrial Heritage, other organizations like INCUNA and TIKI, of course, are uniquely placed to push industrial heritage to the front of the agenda when it comes to emerging from the pandemic. And before we go any further, I'd like just to remind us all of a moment in 2012, which was the opening of the 2012 Olympics in London. And um, this was something I wasn't looking forward to. I was expecting it to be a dire affair. And as it turned out, Danny Boyle, the director, produced something perhaps the first time I have seen industrial heritage, our industrial past and history promoted on the world stage so effectively. And the, the, this was received very positively indeed. And what it shows to me at least is that our industrial heritage is widely appreciated by 
normal people and working communities across the world and therefore we should have confidence in promoting it in the future. And one way of promoting our industrial heritage in all of your countries is to take a look at what your national priorities are, what your government and local governments are wanting to do uh, by way of promoting um, development and well-being in each of your countries. And in Scotland, we have something called the National Performance Framework. So a couple of years back, we set about drafting an industrial heritage strategy that aligned itself with our government's priorities, because we knew that there'd be no way of eliciting much in the way of political and economic financial support, especially from the public sector, if we weren't aligning ourselves to the wider objectives of government. And this isn't difficult when you look at what a lot of countries' objectives are, particularly in relation, to, for example, to sustainable development and education. Industrial heritage has enormous potential to fulfil and to support these aims. And one of the things that's a really good uh, approach is to search out exemplars of good practice and success. And over the last year or so, I have been immensely privileged to be able to visit Asturias in northern Spain and to see some of the work that they've been doing, which is indeed exemplary. And if you take, for example, in Cuna, which is a, a, a national network based in Asturias, but with a global reach, particularly into Latin America and across other parts of Europe, you can see how that has inspired the work of the people in Asturias and in northern Spain more generally. And if you look at the Asturias coal industry, for example, that is on its last legs. I think it may, the last mine may have finally closed now. Um, but what they've been doing is being proactive and getting in there before important, most important sites have been destroyed, making sure that they can be protected and also protecting other assets um, and associated with the coal industry and working with the coal communities. And this has resulted in international links, for example, with my own country, Scotland and our National Mining Museum, and the saving of some very spectacular mining heritage sites. So there's so much remains of the coal and mining landscape in Asturias compared to in Scotland, Wales or England, for example. So they've done a grand job. And that has extended to, obviously, uh, preserving some of the uh, artifacts associated with the industry, but also extensive records, both of the operations themselves and of the mining communities themselves, and a lot of the culture that goes with the mining in the region. So they've done a superb job and hugely impressive. One of the other things about Incuna, for, especially for the Asian network to consider, is the um, scale of output of papers, many of which are published regularly, not just in association with their uh, annual conferences, but with uh, in, in thematic studies and, and so on. So they, it, it really does attract a lot of attention and in this case last year we had contributions from the Museum of Hydropower in Norway which is one of the great um, energy museums in the world so so really it, take a look at Incuna and just see what what they've been doing uh, and this enthusiasm has overflowed into neighboring regions of Spain such as Galicia and we were able to visit this amazing uh, limonite iron ore calcining site um, in Galicia so really inspiring stuff. But I think at this point it's worth stressing the work of the Astorias people probably has its roots in the enormous success of Catalonia. Some of you will know Eusebi Casanellas and he was responsible for this phenomenal museum in Terrassa and this was where Tiki was based and he was president of Tiki, uh, two presidents before me, and he built up this incredible network of museums and resources for the Catalonia area or region, um, which also is well tied into their education system. Um, so an absolutely magical example of what can be done with your industrial heritage.
So if you're looking for inspiration and support in trying to do something for your industrial heritage, then a really good place to start is on the Tiki website and to look at some of our documents that define what industrial heritage is and what's important about it. We kicked this off most recently in 2003 with the Nizhny Tagil Charter, which was signed in the Siberian region of Sverdlovsk in Russia. And then it was enshrined in partnership with ICOMOS, with whom we work very closely on industrial heritage, in what we call the Dublin Principles in, in 2011. And um, these really do give you a, a, a useful handle on how to present industrial heritage, how to describe it, how to, to uh, demonstrate that it's an asset and uh, what it can actually do for you in your various countries. So use these resources and, and do indeed engage with Tiki, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Another centre of industrial excellence is Poland. And like many countries and like ourselves in Scotland, they've had many casualties because there's so much to lose. But they've also done some incredible things, such as in the textile city of Łódź and here in Upper Silesia, uh, where they again like in Astorias their coal mining industry is gradually coming to a close with an amazing range of architecture from different periods from the German period of Silesia through to the Soviet period you can see a, a great uh, Soviet period uh, tower on the top right hand side and mining villages with incredible architecture so they're doing some great things trying to save this this uh, extraordinary industrial heritage Here's another example of one of the great coal mines. And increasingly, um, they are getting more industrial heritage onto UNESCO's World Heritage List, such as the Tarnowski Gori Lead and Silver Zinc Mine up on the top right. They have a superb um, zinc uh, factory museum uh, on the bottom right here. And it's worth remembering that it was the Poles that got industrial heritage onto the World Heritage List in the first place with the inscription of the Wieliszka Salt Mine. Um, near, near Krakow in the early days of World Heritage. So, so the Poles are, are really, really impressive. And um, back in Scotland, we have managed to demonstrate what what is possible by saving some of the more iconic uh, pieces of industrial urban landscape. This, these are examples are in Clyde uh, in Renfrewshire. So this, these are sugar warehouses and refineries in, in uh, Greenock, uh, and they have formed the heart of a riverside in the, in the Clyde regeneration scheme. And what it showed was there was not the need to lose amazing pieces of industrial architecture, like Fergusley number one spinning mills, which you can see at the bottom right, which despite being given the top level of protection, were lost in the 1980s. This was part of the global Coates and Clark empire of cotton thread. So if you don't need to lose this stuff, you can reuse it and the character of your city or town can live on. This has been no better demonstrated than in Dundee, which was the center, world center of the jute industry, jute textile industry, until it died. And thanks to the protection regimes imposed by the Scottish Government Agency Historic Scotland, my organization, uh, it, it was possible to stop many of these mills from being demolished. The character of Dundee has survived and it's because of this strong heritage character that the Victoria and Albert Museum in London decided to build its first major annex outside London in Dundee and that has proved to be an amazing success. You can see the, the building on, on the right side of this slide, a truly amazing place. But the industrial heritage allowed it to be sufficiently attractive to attract this museum. And um, even the most mundane industrial heritage can be iconic. Uh, I regard cranes as being uplifting heritage, not just in terms of uplifting stuff, but uplifting morale. And these cranes are part of the Imperial Shipyard in Gdansk, which was where Solidarity, the Solidarity Movement led by Lech Walesa uh, was, was born. And people are trying to save this shipyard at the moment. And even though Gdansk is a Hanseatic port of great beauty, hundreds of years old, when you go there at Christmas, what of their Christmas decorations, their Christmas illuminations are of cranes. And that tells you how much the industrial heritage is built into the psyche of the local population. 
Obviously, there are some really iconic pieces of industrial heritage out there. For us, the Fourth Bridge is the great catalyst for promoting our industrial heritage in Scotland. Uh, and there are other examples like Volkling and Ironworks in Saarland in, in Germany, a, a truly astonishing place. But I think it's really important to remember that this is at the top end, the massive scale. And industrial heritage exists at all scales. And at the smaller scale, the texture is really, really important. And it can play a major part and a much more sustainable part and a much more adaptive part in any rege regeneration and recovery strategy. So it doesn't need to be enormous and iconic to be able to make a difference. And this is well illustrated by this power station that you can find in the center of, of Istanbul. Uh, and it's now, thanks to a major conversion scheme, part of the University of Bilgi. And it's really interesting because it's a fully functioning university campus, but they've managed to save an awful lot of the original equipment inside it, generation equipment, uh, control rooms and so on. So it makes for an absolutely fascinating environment for study and also uh, especially for technical students and architects and so on. It really gives them an inspiring environment in which to learn their trade. So it's a very special place. And in a city like Istanbul, whose traditional heritage and architecture is unsurpassed in the world, to find this piece of fantastic industrial heritage was really inspiring. And when sticking with energy, some energy is, is, is equally inspiring for different reasons. And in this period of climate awareness and climate emergency, it's really good to know that the heritage of renewables is really significant too. And for Scotland, we have a really interesting and inspiring history of renewable heritage, particularly hydropower. So this is, you mustn't just rule out um, something because you don't think it would be of interest because even the modern industries themselves, as we know from many countries, are inspiring and show great potential, especially in Norway, for example, where the Norwegian Museum of Hydropower exists at Tisadal. And some energy, it, you might think, was particularly impossible, particularly given, for example, the gas industries contaminating uh, processes. It leaves a terrible legacy behind. But even gas works in places like Amsterdam in the Netherlands have been very successfully converted into other use. But perhaps this is the best example I've come across, which are these amazing gas holders, not gasometers, gas holders um, in the city of Vienna in Austria, which were converted in a project commencing in 1999. I mean, wouldn't it have been tragic if these had been lost? So there you go. Again, Austria, an amazing cultural center, but not really known necessarily for its industrial heritage. Some of our infrastructure and landmarks are not necessarily as spectacular as that, but uh, we can say for sure that canals are really significant. And in Scotland, our canal system has provided an enormously important conduit through the centre of Scotland that has acted as a means of promoting regeneration in some of our most deprived areas. And really attracted some amazing projects like the Kelpies sculptures on the right hand side. These canals were brought back to life uh, thanks to thousands of volunteers stopping the railways who bought them, destroying them in the 1960s and then literally digging them out by hand. And now we have across Scotland and the UK a most amazing canal system which is used by hundreds of thousands of people every year and is a, a, a fantastic uh, source of regeneration and community building across the country. And some of our maritime navigation and shipping heritage has also been a, a great source of regeneration and tourism. So our lighthouses are amazing. Some of these lighthouses were effectively designed by the same people who designed the lighthouses of Japan, for example. So there are lots of international links to be had here. So a really huge potential. And even some of the most potentially unattractive things like concrete have huge potential heritage value. One of our most important concrete monuments is the Glenfinnan Viaduct, otherwise known as the Hogwarts Express Viaduct from the Harry Potter films you can see here at the bottom. And the, this amazingly revolutionary concrete uh, technology uh, pioneered by uh, 
Robert McAlpine, uh, was then taken forward into the 20th century into the offshore oil platform construction. And here you can see one of the condeeps built in a Scottish fjord being towed around to Shell's Brent oil field in the 1970s. A thing of, built on the most amazing scale, wondrous technology, heroic technology. And this is something, again, our Norwegian colleagues are really interested in promoting, given their own interests in condeeps and the oil industry. So really amazing stuff. And these industries demonstrate the value of forging links with working industry. Our historic industry can not only work towards our future in terms of heritage, but it can also provide all sorts of links with existing industries and skills and so on. So we need to think positively, and, as I said, see our industry always as a potential asset. And talking of our future, we in Scotland um, are leading the way in terms of building climate action plans to try to address the climate emergency, particularly in the context of the heritage we manage, because we think our heritage can work towards mitigating some of the effects of climate change, particularly by seeing its value and not demolishing it, not destroying it and reusing it and recycling the embodied energy already invested in it, but also understanding the thermal efficiency and performance of some of these old buildings and working out how to adapt them so they work well in the current environment. And in addition, trying to work out how the new excessive rainfall damages these buildings and work out how to reduce the damage. So we're doing a lot of work in that sense and finding a new use, a second life for often substantial industrial buildings has to be a good thing more generally. So, so we've been doing a lot of work and we will continue to promote sustainable development, sustainable reuse, adaptive reuse of our industrial heritage wherever we can. And we want to encourage this on a global scale. And of course, nowhere better can be found examples of the texture of recycling industrial buildings than Taiwan. And over the last few years, I've been privileged to visit both Taichung and Taipei and seen some fantastic adaptive reuse of industrial sites um, and done with such flair and energy. So really good to see. And I know that there are similar pieces of work being done across the Asia Pacific region. Great work in Japan and the People's Republic of China um, and obviously in, in India too. There's some really good conversions and really creative solutions uh, being found. Um, so inspiring stuff and um, great that I managed to see these particular examples in person. And just to look at the, the um, Asian Network's website is to see something that is um, growing and inspiring. And so congratulations to all of you that have been working on that, it's fantastic. And talking of um, excellence, I suppose it's important to refer back um, to where the Artiki voyage in Asia began, which was in Taiwan in 2012. Um, and that was a magical experience. And we made, met, made many new friends from across Asia at that meeting. Um, and this is my uh, moment to uh, say a little bit about um, Tiki itself and how we are trying to address some of the issues, the pandemic issues, and just to observe some of the phenomena that are going, that are occurring at the moment. And I think the first thing to say is that we are trying to modernize our membership and to extend it on a global basis. And um, we are very aware, for example, that our membership in the Asia Pacific region is not what it should be. To that end, uh, we have a new Secretary General in the form of Marian Steiner, who has been doing great things, um, arranging for the uh, revamp, a refresh of our brand, of the design of our bulletin, and of our membership literature. So Marion's been an absolutely wonderful influence and I'm hugely grateful to her for her support. So you'll see in the latest issue of the, 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 the bulletin what it looks like and we're translating membership materials into lots of different languages. Stand by for Mandarin. Uh, that's going to be a new one coming your way. Um, so I hope you appreciate the way it looks and that the bulletin's getting stronger and stronger. And we, can, we hope to continue to strengthen what we offer our membership. 
And a key part of that is we are offering a much more affordable membership that's based on ability to pay. So if you're a student, you can join for as little as $5. The standard rate is $10. And if you are an adult, non-student, it can be as little as 10 or as high as 40, depending on what you feel and how much support you want to give. We're also going to be offering a sponsored membership. So we're going to put offer, we're going to invite people to uh, contribute uh, contributions, donations to Tiki, which, which we will support completely funded membership to people in countries who find it very difficult to afford our membership at the moment, just to start people off so they can get a taste of what membership's like. And I urge you, if you haven't joined yet, to join. If you have joined but your membership has lapsed, please rejoin. And where you can, please encourage other people to join. One of the features of membership is that you register on uh, the, the members' um, interest, member specialist uh, web, web resource. And you can, if you're willing, can have your details made available to others and your specialist interest. So you can find out who else out there has a similar interest or you can find areas of expertise that are lacking in your country. But we need everybody that joins as far as is possible to sign up to that. So we build up this international network of expertise. So do please join. One of the things that's been most extraordinary about the COVID pandemic has been the response on social media, the digital response. And I guess the first time this really came to light was through the work of Francesco Antonio from Italy, who started up a COVID-19 aftermath initiative on Facebook to which I and others contributed. And this bounced me into the world of social media because I'm a bit of a social media cynic. Um, and what happened was absolutely inspiring. And since then, I've been digging into what is, I think, a an iceberg, uh, only a fraction of, of what's out there. But there's been an amazing range of uh, Facebook resources. And one of my favorites is the industrial culture and photography uh, site uh, by the incredible Victor Matcha. Now take a look at this stuff and watch these films. And, I mean, he's a marvelous photographer and cinematographer, and he's been to places you wouldn't possibly believe um, across the world. Um, and many of these places are disappearing and Victor's been recording them. And now as a result of the pandemic, a lot of people are seeing this stuff. So good on Victor, it's just marvelous. And there's so many other places, places uh, resources on, on Facebook. Obviously, Tiki has its own website, but there's national pages like Brazil and India. There's urban industrial heritage, industrial heritage and art, and more than one site devoted to water towers, if that's your thing. So really, you can actually just get sucked in, never to reappear in the world of industrial heritage and Facebook. And I'm very grateful to everybody that's been doing this. And I hope very much that we can embrace all these people in the Tiki global family and harness some of the energy that they are expending more effectively. One of the other things that we've been able to do in Tiki is start to work on advocacy issues more effectively. There's been quite a few major cases, for example, in Mumbai, in Sydney, in Budapest, in Stockholm, this is the most recent one, and um, this is a beautiful fish-bellied steel, early steel railway bridge um, in Silesia, in Poland, which was scheduled to be blown up as part of the, the Mission Impossible film, film set for the next film, hence my term, a cruise missile threat from Hollywood. And so, uh, Tiki Poland solicited my help in trying to stop this happening. I sent a, mess a letter to the Polish Prime Minister. Piotr Gerber campaigned uh, frenetically on the ground. They got the TV involved. And I can safely say this is the only time I can remember my signature appearing on a letter um, on a TV programme. Um, so I'm really, really excited by that. And we've been successful. The Polish government has relented and has now protected the bridge. So we're absolutely delighted about that. And it shows what you can do by fighting together. So that was marvellous. 
We've been signing agreements. So the latest one was in St. Petersburg in Russia before the pandemic began, and that's been hugely exciting. Uh, Russia had been offline since its Congress in Nizhny Tagil in 2003, so it's brilliant to have them back in the family. Uh, it was an incredible event, um, a culture forum in St. Petersburg, uh, which we were fully integrated into. So there again, industrial heritage was being mainstreamed in a wider cultural context, which was marvelous. Uh, one of the more exciting things was having to sign this um, in Russian. I have no idea what it says, but I think it says what it says in the English version. So uh, we're really delighted that, that I'm very, very grateful to our Russian partners and colleagues for helping us do that. And there are more in the pipeline. So we are slightly stalled with our Saudi Arabian adventure, but hopefully after the pandemic that will get going. And really what I urge you in the Asia Pacific region is please get as many countries as possible uh, involved and organized at a national level in Tiki. You'll be most welcome. Which brings me on to one of the reasons for getting organized, which is uh, national congresses. As I said, the Asia story began in 2012, um, and now the, we have a new Congress coming up within a year. Um, the last Congress was in South America, in Chile, um, and that was when I was elected as president in Seoul, this amazing World Heritage Site. And the next one is moving to North America. And the lady on the left in the scarf, Lucy Morisset, is organizing the next one in Quebec, Montreal, Canada, in exactly a year's time, um, in um, October uh, 2021. So I hope as many of you as, of you as possible will be able to get there. One of the big challenges will be to make it happen. And still there's lots of uncertainty surrounding it. So this is uh, the, the call for papers um, that it may well have expired by the time you see this presentation. But if you really wish to contribute an, a paper or a session or join a session, please keep an eye on this and do contact Lucy if you've got a really, really good idea. I think it's really important that the Asia Pacific region has a strong presence especially in the aftermath of COVID. There's going to be some great sessions. I, for one, am really looking forward to the atomic the nu nuclear energy session. And what that demonstrates is that there are some interesting uh, contested histories that need to be addressed by industrial heritage. We're going to be doing things differently, having learned some great lessons from other congresses, not least Lille and Santiago. So one of the things we've noticed is that the national reports are really amazing and we don't want to have them tucked away in a concurrent session. So we're going to put aside a substantial time for as many countries as possible to deliver short presentations on what's been happening in their countries in the last three years. This should be really, really interested. And if part of the conference has gone digital and is live streamed, I hope that this can be shared with an even bigger audience across the world. So we really hope to innovate and improve the Tiki Congress experience. Perhaps the biggest thing to note from my perspective is there's going to be a elections to the board. So if you want to get involved or you want to vote for somebody else to get involved or nominate somebody else to get involved, for example, to become president or whatever, which would be great, please get yourselves organized because only national representatives can vote and you need to have five Tiki members to have a national representative. So you need to get as many members as you can signed up in your countries, get yourself a national representative so they can then in Montreal vote in a new board. So we're hoping that Tiki 20, 2021 will be the best yet and that we it will be a conference where people actually attend and that we will at last meet our friends again and meet many more friends I say again, please come if you can. I'm, I'm sure our Canadian friends are going to put on a great show. And finally, a couple of general comments. Never underestimate industrial heritage's power and particularly within that railway heritage. You know this in all of your countries, everybody's got railway heritage and people who love railway heritage. So use that because of all the branches of heritage, it has the greatest educational power. We've used a piece of our railway heritage to great effect, deploying laser scanned 
digital 3D technologies to create some incredibly powerful education resources launched by our Cabinet Secretary for Education um, and our Deputy First Minister John Swinney last year using the fourth bridge and creating 3D models. Because my message to you is it's time to pollute our younger generations with industrial heritage. It is so powerful. We are feeding this into our curriculum for excellence and promoting science, technology, engineering and math subjects, which urgently need to be promoted in our schools. Industrial heritage does this better than any branch of heritage. So our go forth packages are now available directly through our web resources across all schools in Scotland. So we're delighted by that. But we also need to think more broadly about skills and the potential fusion of our tangible and intangible heritage. So we need to use these more effectively um, in the future. So some quick conclusions. Industrial heritage has its roots in our working communities across the world. It is unique in having such strong connections with real people. It is not exclusive. It is not excluding or elitist. It is the heritage of the people. It's a force for sustainable and, um, sorry, sustainable development and for regeneration on a human level. It has far more potential for adaptive reuse and a second life than most people realize. Most people want to clear it and see it as a liability, so we need to persuade them otherwise. It also tackles some difficult histories, and these do not need to be so difficult to handle. And as a really good example at the moment, a lot of Scottish industry had the roots of its investment and its raw materials in slavery. This is a difficult history, but it's also fascinating and we really need to address it more intelligently. And again, this has strong links into education. So it is an incredibly powerful educational resource on both historical and technical levels. One thing the pandemic is likely to do is to give a lot of people more time. So more people will be able to contribute and volunteer to look after their industrial heritage and bring it back to life. And more than any other form of heritage, our industrial heritage can act as a bridge between generations because older people who used to work in this heritage are in a brilliant position to keep it alive and to pass on the histories and cultures and traditions and techniques to new young generations so that these facets of our heritage can live on. And perhaps more than anything, our industrial heritage is an incredible link between our intangible heritage and our tangible heritage, whether that is the brass bands of our coal fields and our coal mining communities, or whether it is the techniques associated with electrical engineering or looms, hand loom weaving, or electrical looms or anything else of a technical nature, but which is old and dying out, we can keep it alive. A hugely important part of our tangible heritage. Thank you very much for listening and I hope the rest of the forum is a big success. Thank you.